Hello guys, welcome to a new chapter of the Empress Dowager CG. This is going to be chapter 8. A Vendetta Against the West, 1869-1871. Prince Chung had been CG's earliest and staunchest ally when she launched the coup nearly a decade earlier. His motive had been to oust a group of incompetent fools whom he blamed for the Empire's defeat and his Emperor brother's death. Unlike Siji, he had no intention of changing policy, but instead wanted to make the country stronger so that it could one day avenge itself on the Western powers. His support for Siji in the coup and his cooperation with her over the years had been based on the assumption that this was also what she wanted. But as the 1860s passed, Prince Chung began to see that revenge was not on Siji's agenda and that she was actually attracted to Western ways. When after the internal rebellions were quelled, many called for the expulsion of the Westerners, she had ignored them. At the beginning of 1869, Prince Chung decided that he must act and present Siji with a memorandum, reminding her of the burning of the old Summer Palace and the death of her husband in exile. He wrote that the late emperor had died with an acute grievance in his heart, a grievance that was still an acute uh, grievance in his own heart making him feel like he could not live under the same sky as the enemy. Brushing aside the compelling fact that trade with the West had enriched the country, he demanded that she expel all Westerners and close China's door. Six things had to be done, he said. One was to boycott foreign goods, so that Westerners would have no incentive to come to the country, and he asked the court to set an example by publicly destroying all Western products in the palaces. The Foreign Office should compile a list of all the foreigners in Beijing so that when the time came to break off relations they could be wiped out, if need be, a job for which he volunteered his services. The Prince wanted Siji to issue a decree to all of provincial chiefs, telling them uh, to encourage the gentry and the people to burn foreign churches, loot foreign goods, kill foreign merchants and sink foreign ships, stressing that these actions must take place simultaneously in all provinces. Ending his long memo, Prince Chung told Siji bluntly that she must fulfill the dying wish of her late husband and that she must not let a day go by without thinking about revenge, never forget it for a minute. Siji did not want to tie the empire to the chariot of retribution. Even if we do not forget the grievances for a day, grievances don't get dressed by killing people or burning houses, she reasoned. She sent Prince Chung's memo to the grandees for discussion. They were all startled by the violence of his proposal and told Siji to keep it as a top of all top secrets, not to be leaked out. To Prince Chung, they made emollient noises, praising his sentiment and condoning such measures and shunning Western goods in the Forbidden City, except useful items like clocks and guns. But they made clear that they were opposed to the aggressive thrust of his proposal on the grounds that it could lead to war with the West, which China could not win. Suddenly, Prince Chun accepted the Grandi's verdict, but he was far from convinced. It was soon after this exchange that Prince Chun insisted on the execution of Little Lan. Siji was in no doubt that he was striking at her politically as well as personally. While she was waiting for her chance to hit back, Prince Chun plotted his next move. At the time, the meeting of uh, Western and Chinese cultures had resulted in many clashes. While Westerners branded China as semi-civilized, the Chinese called Westerners foreign devils. But the focus of animosity was the Christian missions, which had established themselves in many parts of the country in the past decade. There had been riots against them from time to time, which had acquired a specific term in the language, Jiao An, cases to do with Christian missions. This did not spring from religious prejudice. As Freeman Mitford, the attaché in Beijing, observed, the Chinese did not have strong religious antipathies. If it were otherwise, how is it that a colony of Jews has dwelt among them unmolested for 2,000 years and still remains, at Kaifeng in the province of Honan? How is it that the Mohammedans have flourished exceedingly in certain provinces? On the walls of the Imperial Palace at Pekin, there is a pavilion richly decorated with Arabic inscriptions from the Quran in honor of a Mohammedan lady who was a wife or favorite of one of the emperors. This does not look like persecution for religion's sake, and more than this, Buddhism has been the popular religion. 
Christianity was regarded as a teaching that persuades people to be kind, Quan Ren Wei Shan. Even anti-Christian rioters were not adverse to the doctrine. Their anger was directed at the missions themselves. Being foreign was always a cause of suspicion, but the major problem was that the mission had become a competing authority at the grassroots levels. There, local officials traditionally exercised absolute authority over all disputes and dispensed justice, or its justice according to their judgment. The English traveller Isabella Bert once sat outside the gate of a country's chief office, the Yemen, and observed its workings. In the hour I spent at the entrance of the Yemen of Ying San Xian, 407 people came and went. Men of all sorts, many in chairs, but most on foot, and nearly all were well dressed. All carried papers, and some big dossiers. Within, secretaries, clerks and writers crossed and recrossed the courtyard rapidly and ceaselessly, and Chai Zheng, or messengers, bearing papers were continually dispatched. Much businesses and that of all kinds was undoubtedly transacted. The arrival of missionaries, backed by gunboats, introduced a new form of authority into society. In the numerous disputes ranging from conflicting claims of ownership of water, sources or properties to long-standing clan feuds, those who felt they did not or could not get justice from the local officials often sought protection from the church by becoming converts. In such a situation, a Chinese Christian might go to the priest as Freeman Mitford wrote. Swearing that the church brought against him is a mere pretext, his profession of the Christian faith, in which he is protected by treaty, being the real offense. Full of righteous indignation and confidence in the truth of his convert, who, being a Christian, must necessarily be believed before his heathen accuser, the priest rushed off to the magistrate's office to please the cause of his protégé. The magistrate finds the man guilty and punishes him. The priest is stout in his defense. A diplomatic correspondence ensues, and on both sides the vials of wrath are poured out. How can a priest who interferes and the mandarin who is interfered with love one another? Some angry grassroots officials therefore encourage hostilities against Christians. The resentment was also fueled by genuine misunderstandings. A major one concerned missionary orphanages. In the Chinese tradition, only abandoned newborn babies were looked after by charitable institutions, registered with local authorities. Orphans and foundlings were the responsibility of their relatives, whose treatment of the children was their own business. It was incomprehensible to the Chinese that strangers should be able to take in boys and girls without the consent of their families and relatives, who were not even allowed to visit them, let alone take them away. This practice roused the darkest suspicions. Rumors abounded that missionaries kidnapped children and used their eyes and hearts as medical ingredients or in photography, a mysterious phenomenon at the time. Isabella Bert wrote, Stories of child eating were current, and I'm sure that the people believe that it is practiced by the missionaries. I observed that when we foreigners enter one of the poorer streets, many of the people pick up their infants and hurry with them into the houses. Also, there were children with red crosses on green patches stitched on the back of their clothing, this precaution being taken in the belief that foreigners respect the cross too much to do any harm to children who have them. In 1870, in June, an anti-Christian riot broke out in Tianjin, seemingly triggered by just such a rumor that an orphanage run by the Sisterhood of Mercy, attached to the French Roman Catholic Church, was kidnapping children and gouging out their eyes and hearts for photography and medicine. Several local Christians accused of the actual kidnaps were beaten up by crowds before being delivered to the magistrate's office. Although they were all found to be innocent, one was in fact taking a child home from the church school, thousands of men still crowded the streets and bricks were hurled at local Christians. The French consul in Tianjin, Henri Fontanier, rushed over with the guards and fired a shot at one of the magistrate's servants. The roaring crowd beat the Frenchman to death and then killed between 30 and 40 Catholic Chinese, as well as 21 foreigners. In three hours of lynching, plunder and arson, orphanages, churches and church schools were burned down. Victims were mutilated and disemboweled, and foreign nuns were stripped naked before they were killed. Siege's policy regarding incidents involving Christians had always been to deal with them fairly. Chi Piang Bang Li, 
She did not believe that child eating rumor, which had surfaced time and time again in other areas, and had invariably been proven false. In no uncertain language, she condemned the murders and the arson, and ordered Marquis Seng, the viceroy of Sili, whose office was in Tianjin, but who was at the time absent and ill, to go and intervene at once and arrest and punish the ringleaders of the riot, so justice is done. A decree expressed sympathy for the Christian victims, refuted the rumor and told all provincial chiefs to protect the missionaries. Prince Gong sent extra sentries to patrol outside western houses. Marquis Seng quickly established that the rumor in Tianjin was groundless. He found that this riot seemed to be indifferent uh, from the usual story of local officials going along with an anti-Christian mob. Something more sinister seemed to lie behind it. During the investigation it emerged that the rumor had started with one Commander Cheng Waring, Big Chief Cheng. Arrested rioters confessed that they had learned about the eyes and hearts from the big chief, who, they believe, had the organs in his possession. Cheng had arrived in Tianjin by boat several days before the riot, at which point the rumor began to spread. Blacksmiths started to sell arms, which was prohibited by Qin laws, and thugs and hooligans were in and out of the big chief's dwelling, a temple inn. On the day of the riot, crowds were assembled from street to street by men beating gongs. When the regional imperial commissioner, Chong Wo, tried to prevent them all from reaching the foreign settlement by having the pontoon bridge that led to it dismantled, Big Chief Cheng ordered it reattached and while the crowds were crossing, he called out to them from his boat, Good lads, wipe out the foreigners and burn their houses. During the massacre, Chen, who had a foul temper and a habit of wiping on their legs, was by his own account in the boat, seeking pleasure with young boys. Big Chief Cheng turned out to be a protege of Prince Chung. After Cheng was exposed, the prince wrote repeatedly to Siji, telling her that, I am extremely fond of this man and intend to use him for our cause against foreign barbarians. Chen must be well treated, as all men of ideals in the empire will be watching what happened to him and will see whether the throne had any serious desire to avenge the country. The mob must be encouraged, not punished, warned the prince. It was obvious that Cheng had instigated the riot and behind him stood Prince Chung. It also became clear to CG that Prince Chung had intended the whole country to do as Tianjin did. During the massacre and its aftermath, unrest rippled throughout the empire, with the same eyes and hearts rumors circulating about the missionaries. In some places, posters were put up in the streets announcing that on a specific day, almost come out to slaughter foreigners and destroy churches. Riots, though on a smaller scale, broke out in a number of cities. All this was exactly in line with the memorandum Prince Chun had sent Siji a year earlier, and the conclusion was inescapable that the prince had taken it upon himself to put his scheme into action. Realizing Prince Chun's role, knowing how powerful he was and how popular his ideas were, Siji became cautious. She had to refuse the demand to bring down Big Chief Cheng to justice from the French minister, who had learned about Chen's role from local Christians. To concede to the French demands would arouse her own unmanageable fury against her government and herself. There were already petitions calling for her to ride the wave of Tianjin riot and ban Christian missions, destroy churches, and drive out all Westerners. Grandees fume against any punishment of the rioters, who were held up as heroes, admired by people like Grand Tutor Wang. A scenes of murder and arson were drawn on elegant fans, and appraised by the literati as works of art. Marquis Seng incurred much wrath for taking the side of the foreign devils and was made to feel like an outcast. In front of the throne, in discussions about the riot, Prince Chung held sway, and no one dared to suggest that Big Chief Cheng be punished. Arrogantly, the prince denounced Siji's government for having done nothing in the past ten years towards the goal of exacting retribution. Siji's position had already been drastically weakened by the little Anne episode. Now she felt she had to ingratiate herself with Prince Chung by pretending to go along with him. She told him and the other grandees that she too regarded foreign barbarians as sworn enemies, but her problem was that her son was not of age and all she could do was keep things ticking over until he reached his majority. Perhaps feeling that she must use all her powers to charm and arouse sympathy, 
CG had a yellow silk screen removed and faced the grandees, quite possibly for the first time. Appearing appealingly helpless, she begged them to tell her Empress Sen what to do as we don't have a clue. At this juncture, on July 25, 1870, CG's mother died. During her illness, she had consulted not only Chinese doctors but also the American physician, Mrs. Hatlan who had become a trusted friend of many aristocratic families. Siji sent people to her mother's house to pay large respects on her behalf and prayed for her at a shrine that she had set up in her apartment. She arranged for her mother's coffin to be placed in a Taoist temple for a hundred days, during which time an abbot led a daily service. But she herself did not leave the Forbidden City. Security was much harder to guarantee in the Beijing streets. Perhaps some ominous instinct warned her. Around this time, the court astrologer who watched the stars and made interpretations in the European equipped Imperial Observatory, set up by the Jesuits, predicted that a major official would be assassinated. This was an extraordinary prediction, as assassinations were virtually unheard of in Qin history. A month later, Viceroy Ma Xinji was assassinated in Nanjing. He had exposed some rumor mongers spreading false accusations against missionaries and had punished them. As a result, he had prevented a Tianjin-like massacre in Nanjing. Meanwhile, as the main victims of the Tianjin riot were French, including the consul, Henry Fontanier, French gunboats arrived and fired warning shots outside the Dagu forts. War seemed inevitable. Siji had to move troops and make preparations. Marquis Seng, who had been sick, collapsed in a series of nervous fits and took to his bed. He wrote to Siji, China absolutely cannot afford war. No one in the court, not even those who call for most loudly for revenge, had any answer to the show of the French Navy. At this critical moment, the man who gave Siji most useful support was Earl Li, then the viceroy of another region, as China was divided into nine vice royalties. He set off at once uh, with his army to defend the coast and produced practical advice on how to solve the crisis diplomatically. Convicted murderers must be executed, he counseled, but the number should be kept to a minimum in order to not inflame the population. The foreign office should explain to the legations who were pressing for the rioters to be punished that excessive executions would only create more determined enemies and would not be in Westerners long term interest. Another argument he proposed for Beijing to say was that it understood that Westerners cherish the intention of treating ordinary Chinese with generosity and hold sacred the principle of not killing lightly. It knew that missionaries preach kindness. All these sentiments ran counter to large-scale executions. Appreciating his understanding of the West, Siji made the Earl the Viceroy of Sili which, being the region surrounding Beijing, was the most important base royalty. As the vice royalty's capital was Tianjin, a treaty port inhabited by Westerners, the Earl could directly deal with them. He was also, of course, close to Beijing. The Earl succeeded Marquis Sen, who after a long illness died in 1872. With advice from Earl Li, Prince Gong hashed out a conciliatory solution designed to satisfy the French while not further enraging the xenophobic Chinese. Twenty criminals were sentenced to death and twenty-five were banished to the frontiers. Many of the men had no proper name, an indicator of the wretched lives they led. They were merely called Liu the Second, Son, Deng the Old and so on. The man heading the execution list was identified as Lame Man Feng. On the day of the execution, these men were feted like heroes by officials and bystanders alike, enjoying their only moment of glory. Two local officials who had been involved in the riots were punished, but only for their election. Not forceful enough in suppressing the mob, and were sentenced to exile to the northern frontiers. Their stay was short, as the whole empire is watching their fate, war Marquis sang. As for Commander Cheng, he was found to be totally innocent, the mildest language was used in court correspondence about him in case he should be riled. Compensation was paid to the victims and to the churches for repairs. Chongo, the official who had tried to protect the Westerners by having the pontoon bridge dismantled, 
was dispatched to France to declare Beijing's condemnation of the riot and to express its wish for conciliation and friendship. This trip was, and is still, misinterpreted as Siji sending Chongo to grovel. Prince Chung furiously denounced it. France accepted this solution. It was at war with Prussia and Europe and could not embark on another in the East. The Chinese Empire narrowly escaped a war. Prince Chung was unrepentant about the crisis he had provoked, and sulking about the solution, claimed that he was suffering from sickness of the heart and stayed in bed. There he wrote Siji three long letters, treacherously criticizing her for not encouraging the Tianjin rioters and not getting people all over China to follow their example. She had let down her late husband, he implied. Siji's response was all platitudes and avoided engaging with his point. Prince Chung would not let her off the hook. He immediately fired off a fourth letter, reiterating his accusations and allegating that, thanks to her, foreigners are running even more rampant. He had noticed her evasiveness. What the decree says is not all that I want, uh, and that I was talking about. There is not a word about the business of foreign barbarians. This is scary and worrying in the extreme. Siji was forced to address the issue, but she insisted that the expulsion of Westerners was not on the agenda, and China should still aim for peaceful coexistence with foreign countries. Thanks to the support of Prince Gong and key officials like Er Li, she managed to ignore Prince Chung. The prince's bitterness continued to fester. At the beginning of the following year, 1871, he wrote again, going on and on complaining about the same thing, that Siji was not seeking revenge against the West. Stopping short of denouncing her by name, he made Prince Gong and his colleagues the scapegoats and accused them of fawning over foreign barbarians. The two half-brothers were not on speaking terms, while Siji had to room or humor Prince Chung. Obviously, the prince was quite capable of instigating another Tianjin-style riot, which could well drag the empire into a catastrophic war, yet Siji was powerless to censure him. His anti-foreign stance was so popular with officials and population alike that to battle with him over this issue would be suicidal for Siji. Prince Chung was thus a ticking time bomb for the empire. As leader of the xenophobic faction, he was the main obstacle to Siji's open-door policy, and being the head of the Praetorian Guards, he was in a position to threaten her life. He had not done anything to her so far because, in addition to her being the Emperor's mother and his wife's sister, it would not be long before her son assumed power and she would return to the harem. He would tolerate her for this short interim, but for Siji, the long-term safety of both Empire and herself meant that something had to be done about M the Prince Chung.